So would you please welcome Ann Daly and Bill T. Jones. Have you been Billy boy, Billy boy? Where have you been, John Billy? I've taken me a wife, she's the jolly of my life. She's a young girl and cannot leave her mother. Does she got good hair, Billy boy, Billy boy? Does she got good hair, John Billy? She's got good hair, don't you comb it, don't you try. She will break every comb you can buy. She's a young girl and cannot see her mother. Can she break a corn, can she bake a cornbread, Billy boy, Billy boy? Can she bake a cornbread, John Billy? She can bake a cornbread, it'll crack a nigger's head. She's a young girl and cannot leave her mother. Well, what will we do, Billy boy, Billy boy? Oh, what will we do, John Billy? We'll do a little that and we'll do a little this and we'll give a little piss. We're so young and we cannot find a mother. I knew I'd be superfluous. <laughs> now what that is is, what that is is the company is gonna be, I don't know if I'll do it here, I'm not ready yet, but I'm trying to learn it. That's a Texas prison song I've gotten from an album recorded about 19, oh it's the 30s. It's such an amazing album. I only have a little cassette and it's, these women, all women, just singing, and they're so beautiful, and that's just one of those songs that they're singing, which I think I heard when I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, I, I'm not in, we set out early, and I was hoping I could do something, and of course we have royalties and rights, there's our solos and things I'd like to do, but everything costs so much, so much darn money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, so I was thinking, how could I do something that would be, give me a chance to sing and dance, before we set out early, um, and why do I need to do that? And why am I telling you all this and not letting you ask the first question? Because I'm very excited too, Anne, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's what that song is gonna be. Maybe I'll do it at Northrop, maybe not. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, that was his way of not making me have to say the first thing. <laughs> that's very nice. Uh, so let's actually go with that because I'm interested in your process and how you build your works. Mm. So you have, I, I suspect you found that music mm. a while ago after probably having heard it a long time before that and you're playing with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking how can I dance to that mm. and how tight should it be? I mean, I have- What does that mean, how tight should it be? Well. Where have you been, Billy boy, Billy boy? Where have you been, John Billy? I've taken the old wife, she's the joy of my life. She's a young thing, you cannot be no mother. Did you ask her out, Billy boy, Billy boy? Did you ask her out, John Billy? Yes, I asked her. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so now that, you're figuring out how, what relationship you're going to put between the movement and the music. Yeah, and when, what and you're going to sing this yourself. Right, and what is set and what is uh, improvised. Now, how did you generate the movement? Uh, trying to think of that locomotion that had uh, no steps that I know. That, that was not forward and that was all about uh, everything angular and broken mm. in relationship to each other. Mm. That was a problem. Now, did you improvise? Was is that the basis of no, it? No, that was really made, can I do this, can I do that? And as I'm on this leg, in other words, there's a step called the Susie Q. Yes, we see Go some down. stuff in there. Yes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And this, so how can I keep these things moving together? So it's a formal problem. Oh, yeah. It's a formal problem, and then you mess with it. <laughs> right. 
And you made the movement with the music in no, mind? No, not at no. all. No, okay, no, 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 so that, it's completely that separate. Completely You'd separate. already been... This is an idea from the bathroom the other day in Cardiff. <laughs> all right. Right. And this is where ideas come from. <laughs> and I hear you often talking about just little pit bits that you've made in, on touring. Mm -hmm. You talked about a phrase that we looked at in the show, and you mm -hmm. said, oh, I made that on tour. Yeah. It's still here. Right, right, right. Things have to, because you know, my retention is, you know, I'm an improviser, and thank God for videotape. Do you, vid you video them yeah. then? Thank God for videotape the and Janet Wong. And Janet Wong. Yes. <laughs> Your because rehearsal My rehearsal uh, director, director. Right. And recent collaborator, because she, she and I just did a work together in Cardiff, but the, um, that I can now really do what I love to do, and I, where I think my, my skill is, uh, which is to, to let it flow out. And all of the concepts I have about dance making, the problem solving, I'm doing them as I'm dancing. Now, that's one way of working. The other way is like, like Trisha. Trisha says she's an inventor of movement. She does this. Trisha Brown. She does this. Then she says, well, can I do this? And my legs do that. And she builds, builds, builds in little increments like that. That's one way also those phrases that you're talking, the word sonata were actually built in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what you see, and we set out early, uh, for instance, in the final movement, actually almost all of the, the movement material comes from Bill in the studio mm -hmm. uh, with a camera on, dancing to Stravinsky as if he put on James Brown. You know, uh, or whatever, you know, pick your favorite music that makes you want to get up and dance, uh -huh. and tape recording it. Then why do you use the Stravinsky? Pardon? Then why do you have because the Stravinsky? It's in dialogue with him. I like to dance to music. I mean, I love to dance in silence, and, and I, I say that there's music in my joints and, uh, um, and in the muscles, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, let your backbone slip, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Why that, would you put on the Stravinsky rather than the Brown? Because I'm going to be making a piece with Stravinsky. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I did a piece. In that case, then, the music is pre-existing. Oh, you made I, the choice about the oh, music. Oh, yeah. The choice of the music comes first. Case. And I have listened to it and listened to it and listened to it in my car, at home, what have you. So I feel I understand yeah. something about it. And then, and then I, I dance to get it. Get in the studio. And then Janet can take that tape. She and I sit together and look at it and say, this is good. That's not so good. Let's use this. Let's use that. And she learns it. And she learns it in the score. Right? Yeah. Uh, and therefore, we can teach it in the score. Now, that's raw material. Right. Now, how do you cut and paste? Right. Ah, oh, we need something here different. Okay, well, Alex, you, Eric, go over there. Can you make a duet out of this part? And, uh, well, that's good. Oh, that's not so good, guys. Let's start over again, that sort of thing. And that's how we, we make the piece. Now, working on myself, I said I have a very short retention. I just, it's hard to remember long sequences. Mm -hmm. So it's something, as I'm doing a solo show next year, mm -hmm. and I'm really trying to grapple with that, how to... I don't want, I really would like that show to be 75% set, 80%, 90% set. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's a lot, right. you know, because I can hit that button, boy, I can go, you know. I Do don't need to set it, but mm -hmm. I, I want to set it. Do you ever bore yourself? When you're dancing, do, uh, <laughs> in terms of vocabulary, I'm an onanist. what are you talking there about? Was, there was a quote, and I can't remember where it was, you said you were now working on uh, vocabulary rather than dancing. And one of the things that struck me going through the show mm. was how I could see your vocabulary from very early on. Mm. Mm. And so I'm wondering, I mean, I've heard other dancers uh, talking about improvising and saying, I get to a point where I, I get stuck. Mm -hmm. where new material is not coming out. Mm. So first of all, I say to those dancers, yeah. where are you dancing? Mm. You want me to go dance in that corner now? Make something in that corner, that edgy <laughs> stage right there? What about that seat between those two ladies right there? Right there. Okay, where? Mm -hmm. What's going on in the room? Mm -hmm. And that's where Stravinsky comes in. That's where Vlasic comes in. That's where silence comes in. That's where Beethoven. So my greatest dance is Bjorn, my companion, is cooking dinner. Mm -hmm. But I'm really into Beethoven right now. I'm going to do something with the Archduke. And I'm just in the living room, just, just dancing. I mean, that's, I mean, it's always, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I, I think that's, 
So it's so, such an interesting way of looking. I won't go there. It's about, it's about being an African American. You know? I know what you're thinking. <laughs> right. As Jelanis Davis said, we taught the world to take a solo, she said. You know? Oh, go there. You, you want to go there. No, I don't. No? I'm wondering where they want to go. I hear okay. you've been talking about this a lot, right? Why? No. No, today I'm, what difference not, does it, I'm not talking he, about that. Today. No, okay. I can't tell whether he wants to or not. No, I'm just uh, teasing. I, I know we'll get there. Okay, you know, this we're, whole, we're gonna get there. There's, a, there's a, so <laughs> many minefields, you know what I mean? There's we, so many. We, we've already kind of are in the middle of a discussion also, which is kind of very mm -hmm. odd. We started one earlier, so we're trying to be well behaved in public for a while. Mm. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> so no, the you music, know what she's talking music, about? You know what she's talking about? He said, I said to her upstairs, I said, you know, never in my life have I been so self-aware. And um, there is uh, a very confessional side. Uh, side? No, there is a problem here. You know, the drop of a hat, I'm going to tell you really what I'm feeling. You know, it's kind of, that's boring. And, and, <laughs> and the fact is that that mm -hmm. is interviews, everything, mm -hmm. tell exactly how you feel, you know. And then answer a question about your art, and now you're going to talk about what it means to be descendant of slaves. What's that got to do with your art? It has a lot to do with your art, but can you answer the question without going to the personal? And I said that now, I, there was a time before I never even said that to myself, but now I realize I'm 46 years old, and I really want to control the discourse a bit more. So that's what she's talking about. I said that I, never before have I been so aware of how I'm coming across. Mm. Therefore, well, I make decisions about it. Can we use your show here as a way of maybe getting to uh, mm -hmm. very, what I find a very interesting statement of yours that you've never been so self-aware before, mm. which I, I will believe, but yet I think um, you have been one of the most self-aware artists, I think, um, that we've had in dance. So. Um, well, when you let, look let's at look at that term. Let's look at that term. And you got to be careful when you're talking to these folks. With even what? even the nice ones like Anne, right? These these journalistic types. The terms. Okay. Now, what did you say before? Now, what did you say? I would go to the videotape, but uh, <laughs> no. I said the it, term. it's interesting to hear that self-aware. Right. Which is oh, what was your and term? And I would say rather than you use said it, you've never been as self-aware right. before, and I'm saying, gee. And you said you said you have been a, a self. Never, there's never been, there's very few dancers who have been as self-aware, and I'd say there's very few dancers who have been less censored or less mm. uh, circumspect. Mm. And a lot of that has to do with the way we're taught to be modern artists. Right. And, um, and I don't, I'm not so necessarily proud of it, that it's been so easy to get in, you know? You know what I mean? It's, it's easy to get this dude. You know, you, you push certain buttons and he's there, you know? You got your quotes, and then they're going to quote them back to you in five years. And you know, you said at one point, you know. So you feel your own articulateness mm -hmm. coming back Mouthiness? to haunt. No, articulateness. Mm -hmm. No, I can talk. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. There are many mouths, but not all articulate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> coming, it sounds like you're being haunted, you're feeling haunted by that discourse, by mm. that articulateness. Not only... And yes, the media willing, machine what runs you're willing on to that, share. quotes. Yeah. And I think that yeah. you know this about those of you who have been promiscuous in this life, of which I'm sure there's so few, <laughs> right? Uh, that there's something about giving it to the one you love, and there's something about giving it to eight people, you know? And uh, I, my generation that I come from, you know, break down the walls, brothers mm -hmm. and sisters, mm -hmm. let the sun shine. We're all one, we're flowing into each other, you know. I actually believe it. Mm -hmm. And I've actually tried to behave that way in a professional mm -hmm. arena. And do you know what they do to you? <laughs> you are sirloin, right? <laughs> good quotes, right, very good. In particular when there's issues, right? Particularly when there's issues, sexy issue like you know, when nobody's, everyone's scared shitless to talk about it, and then you suddenly start talking about it as if you're talking to somebody who loves you. That's it. Who are you talking to, man? 
I'm not you talking mistook to somebody them who for me. someone who loved you. I didn't know difference. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't really know any difference. We are all one. Right. And also, as a performer, yeah. I would think isn't part of the point. They love me. I'm sorry. The part of performing, the performer-spectator dynamic. Mm -hmm. no, unfortunately, that was not true. No. 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 It, that is, you know. Um, I, I, was so, I, mean, I was so distressed to hear that Billie Holiday felt that her whole life that people were laughing at her when she performed. Mm -hmm. she, she was always, we hear it now, and it's miraculous. But you know, she walked off stage saying, those motherfuckers, God damn it, those motherfuckers, they, were, you know, they didn't like it, they're just pretending or whatever. You know? Well, there's a sickness that goes with that. And I must admit that coming from where I came from, the time I came from, meeting Arnie, this life we were trying to live, and then making art, which was going to be direct and honest, and oftentimes using techniques, like the song I started singing today. That's comforting to my soul, that song, right? I feel like a little window opens up in time and space. I'm able to go through and breathe air from people that are long dead. But I was doing that with people who were different than I am. Their skin color was different. Their physicality was different. Their sensibility was different. Nobody knew how to say amen. You know, mm -hmm. how when somebody like, you know, you've seen it now. I mean, I remember I was in high school I, after Mark King made that, um, well, he was always on television in those days. Remember in the evening news, well, I don't know who I'm talking to, but the evening news, you'd see a demonstration or, or him in the church talking, and then you'd hear, and this was the first time a lot of people heard a black church service. And they, people would, all right, preach, brother. Yes, yes, brother. Go on now. Go on. Tell them about it. Right? Now, so, you're talking about performing, and they love you. No, you, I dance. You I got call. no sense well, that people, come on. People I mean, are you who know. they are. They tell you later, I loved what you did. Mm -hmm. Or they hold your hand. Or and you play, early on, you played with that dynamic. I mean, you talked about you being my point able was that to I did not really know how to talk, and I was expecting something back. What that were you was, expecting back? Well, I just told you what I expected back. But I was talking to an, an avant-garde that was, let's face it, comprised of people who are not like I am, mm -hmm. and that was, a, and that caused a kind of a. I felt every time it was over, really exposed and all, and I didn't know what, what they applauded. And then I'd read the next day what one person said, right? But you never got the feeling, and here's the us, here's the community, here's all this stuff mm -hmm. we're talking about now a lot. I wanted to feel we came here to commune. Okay. And I, I will be the conduit here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And through me, and I'll let it out, and you will, and we'll get back, and we, because it's not about me, it's about us. Mm -hmm. So, 30 years, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you think it's still possible? Oh no, I don't expect the same no. things anymore. I can't, like I say, I'm not promiscuous anymore either. I know where to go get that. Other things uh, we now, I think we, as an art, sophisticated art going public, we're probably more, con more convinced by being allowed don't seduce me, brother. Oh. This is not church. Show me something. Let, me, let it come into my eyes and go to my mind. And if I choose, go to my heart. Don't manipulate me. That's fair. So now I've been thinking about what can we share? And I think we can share. There's something you think is well made. If there is passion in it, you will have people's respect. Maybe they won't say, amen, amen. It's not who they are. They're Scandinavian, Minnesotans, or what have you. You know, they don't do that, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Amen. amen. <laughs> so make the art, let people come to it. I mean, I have, there's a lot of things I have uh, to learn. I don't have to seduce all the time. Oh, it's so much fun. So it, it sounds <laughs> like your audience, mm -hmm. you, ha you have revisioned your audience. Revisioned. And reconceived mm. of then what that relationship is and Perhaps what that, the art can yeah. be to accomplish mm. we today. And one of my questions that I had had for you was thinking, you know, do you think there is a we even? So I know a there's a we. Yeah. Anything else is 
Excuse the term bullshit. It's a very different we, though. You know, oh, yeah, than you're just talking about. But the about, fact is, there yeah. is a we. There is a. Who is the we? It's us in this room right now. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? You know that bombing in Oklahoma. When that happened, boom! All those people who didn't know each other's names suddenly were now. We were there, and we were all breathing air, and the air was suddenly filled with uh, violence and death, and some of us died. We. That's the truth of who we are. Now, does that mean that I have to do what you do? Does that mean that I have to like you, believe what you like? Let's, let's get that straight. If you have a body, you are a part of a community. Mm -hmm. And we can express that. We can even take it to the animal community. That's also the we. Now, who are you making your art for? Right. Who can understand what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, what is your power? You know. Uh, yeah, there's a we, but I didn't let you finish. Yeah. No. <clears throat> what do you ask of a spectator? Buy your tickets. <laughs> oh, Phil. Well, it's true. Where's Phil? Be beyond that. No, no, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being cute, but... Um, uh, what? what? What never... The, yeah. <laughs> right, I'll stop being so cute. I'm thinking, what do I ask of the spectator? Yeah. Uh, can you give me, uh, give me an hour and a half of your attention, of your focus? Give me two hours, three hours. Uh, can you relax and be quiet for a while? Let me show you this thing. And then, um, listen to what's going on inside as you watch. I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a pretty good audience, and I've been trained by some very good teachers, some very tough work when I was in the university uh, with independent film. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, seeing a film with, uh, by Joyce Wheeland. You know her? She's a very wonderful filmmaker. I guess you'd call her pre-minimalist. And there was one film in particular that we were required to watch in cinema class, and it was called Sailboat. And what it was, was probably a 16 millimeter film, and it was a sailboat for, I don't know, 20 minutes on the horizon, bobbing up and down with the word sailboat. <laughs> hmm. This is a think piece, I think, I said to myself, right? <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, is that the teacher, Larry Gottheim, bless him, he was saying, okay, okay, what's going on with you as you watch it? Listen, what, what, what made you fidget? And did you notice that the music kept changing? Well, what happened as the music changed? Were you aware it had changed? And what happened after you saw Sailboat for a while? Did you stop singing it? And he made me listen to me, listening and watching. Yeah. It was very good, that tough work, you know? Um, you know, John Cage, I, I say to myself, some of the work that's affected me the most has been work that has bored me crazy when I was watching it. Mm -hmm. But uh, later on, I realized that I had had an extraordinary experience because it maybe was not pleasurable as, I as it was happening, but it fed me on another level. It's given me a lot of courage. So I'm asking an audience to have that patience and to trust me. Now, do I deserve your right. trust? Why? Mm. How, how do you figure out why, how or why you deserve that? Tr what do you do? What, what's your part of the bargain? Mm. How, how do you earn that trust? Be fierce. Fierce. Uh, that was a joke. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, what do I mean by be when fierce? When do you think you've been fiercest? No, no, let me life? go back to that. I have got to because the, something that is going to be clear and now it has to be well crafted. Hmm? It's not going to be an insult to you. It's going to, you're going to sense that it has integrity behind it. Time has been put in and consideration. You're going to sense that I, this means something to me. And I believe in it and I'm offering it to you to share. Mm. I, owe, I owe you that. Now, on top of that, I have a wonderful company. Mm. They are uh, lively, they are talented, they're vivid. Um, they also believe in what they're doing. I, 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 don't, I don't truck with, let's just pretend here. It is pretend, but this, right now I want you to feel the, 
the essence of your life is in what you're doing on the stage tonight. Mm -hmm. Not that it's obsessive and crazy, but this is essential to your expression of who you are as a human being. Mm -hmm. for, for someone who's a choreographer and the head of a company, I would imagine your line of obligations not only to the spectator, but to your dancers as mm -hmm. well. Line of obligation? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, this is a hard one, you know. So I'm, I'm well, interested minute, in your minute, dancers. Wait a minute, wait a minute, line of obligation. There was a time when we felt, I don't have to do a damn thing but stay black and die. You ever hear that That's term? not what I heard just a moment ago. No, though. I know, but I'm saying, there's, just, just you understand, uh -huh. it's line of obligation. It's uh -huh. something that you have to, um, it's like a spiritual training, growing into. Some people, I, I, hey, look at me, I'm great, I'm beautiful, look, 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 look. Okay, yeah, that may all be true, uh, but what have you, what are you investing in this moment? And how in this moment is it a shared moment that elevates it past your um, masturbation or what have you? Mm -hmm. Now, that is the line of obligation, which means that I've got to establish a non-cynical, mm -hmm. and I think, I dare say, and this is a dangerous word, a loving relationship with the audience. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, isn't it? Having said what we said before about not being obliged to love each other, but I can't, I can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. I've got to feel that I can show my soft, fleshy parts. And uh, because out there are others like me. Now, that is an obligation. Mm -hmm. Now, go forward. Make your work tough. You know, um, and if you have to have violence in it, if you have to have anger in it, it's at the service of something that's about we. When you walk through the exhibition, your exhibition. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. And don't be afraid. And you see all the bills, all, all the bills. Mm. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Was your, uh, how did you relate to them? Were they? Well, that song uh, was facetious, but it was also, were, I was yeah, trying to, this oh, is the I answer, yeah. this is the best answer I can give you. Because there is a storm that goes on. Yeah. You have to look at what you, yeah. You have to look at your bullshit, you have to look at your triumphs, yeah. look at the misses. Yeah. Uh, which were which? No. You think I'm really going to do that? No, I am. Show I your like soft you, honey, but I'm not going to do that. Here, no, 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 no. It's not important. Not important. Well, let, on a more global level, how, how do you, uh, in terms of the we that's you, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you... Um, think of those bills? I mean, do you have great you know, affection? I'm proud, you have him. Great I'm proud of him. Yeah, I'm proud of Bill a lot. Affection for them mm -hmm. because it's a long history that's brought you to where yeah, you are Yeah, it's not right as now. long as Mercer's. No. <laughs> no, that was very important. It seems like it's it very important that you climb Jacob's quick. Ladder out there in that show, right? Yeah. And you start down here with Bill and Arnie and then you go through Meredith and then you get up into the loftier realms with Mertz and you realize there's a there's 50, how many years is that now that Mercer's been doing this? Over 50 years? Over 50. 60 years. And then I've been, what, Arnie and I, I did my first piece at the university probably in 1970, 71. Uh, there's a difference. There's a difference. So. Do they seem very close or very far to that? you, these bills? Uh, hmm. No, they're close. Mm -hmm. Some more so than others. Oddly enough, those duets, it's like yesterday. Uh, yeah. You know? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like yesterday, yeah. And you know, that's a sentiment. Uh, part of that, yeah. part of that, part of that, you know what it is, you know, it's, and Arnie and I really were, we were making it up. Yeah. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> you know, we were just, we were doing. And we had our heroes, there was Meredith, there was uh, all these people out there, there was Merce, you know, and, and they're all, but we were gonna weigh in. Our Bible was the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, you know, uh, probably a lot of young artists, probably a lot of homosexual artists in particular, but a lot of artists, they were, that was the Bible, you know, and uh, we were just doing it. But, but there's something about that, it's like your first love or your first, uh, first sexual experience, 
you know, it was it's vivid mm -hmm. right there, those duets. And uh, Secret Pastures in its own way, big, big time. Yeah, you it was know. a yeah. big time. Yeah, the, the big, big talk, the tent. The tent, <laughs> right. The tent and the fact that we were really like truly um, Shake your booty, shake your booty. And what do I mean by that, that? Downtown did not shake its booty yeah. at that time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you want to be in the church of the true modernist trajectory, right? Listen, you don't go there. well behaved. Yeah. Well, I'm about well behaved, but there's a lot of yeah. things which you got to rebel, but you got to rebel in a certain in way, a, right? Right. And you don't go. Just, you know, now we we everyone thinks Warhol. You know, everyone Warhol's so cool. You know, pop art. Uh, Ray Kawakuba just moved her boutique from mm -hmm. Soho to the new Chelsea Art Gallery uh, area, right? She makes clothes, but she's an artist. Right? I like her very much, but I'm saying that would have been once considered quite pretentious to right, think, you know. Right. But now, you know, commerce, art, you know, you've seen these super glamorous spreads in this fashion magazine, Helmut Lang at uh, PS1 in front of some minimalist sculpture to the girl who's standing, right, you know, and, you know, the light, the Prada lighting is, it looks like Cindy Sherman photographs or what have you. Uh, that's, that's the water we swim in now, but it, and I'm not claiming we were pioneers, but for some reason it was a shocker it, it to did. our world. You know, people had haircuts, right. you know. It was, it was a weird thing, that happened, weird thing that happened with Secret Pastures because Marcel Fuvet, a right. wonderful guy, had done the hair. With, he was trying all these experimental cuts and he wanted to do makeup and all. And uh, his name got left out of the program. So we had to do a little insert. Now I was told, I didn't see this image, but they said in the in BAM on the opening night, people were opening their programs and dropping on the floor with hair and makeup by Marcel Fivé. Oh my God, look at that. Hair and makeup. It's the first thing that jumps out at you. It's all about it's all about fashion. It's you know, it's well, not, you know, you know. I, I, re I remember going to see Secret Pastures up in the cheap seats, and my first response was oh, how pretentious. It just uh, and, and it took me about a week, I think, to go, oh, I see what he was doing. That's really smart. That was mm. very smart. And then I went on to do my master's thesis on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, had mm. such a surface, which mm -hmm. is now so much a part of our vocabulary of the avant-garde. But it wasn't there yet quite at the time. Mm. And, the, and, the, and the, the patronage and the money. Now, Twyla had been there before, some years before, you realize. With, not with on the scale. Vidal Sassoon and uh, uh, Santo uh, Acosta and all. BAM seemed to put mm. it on, on such a scale. Yeah. I think they very successfully marketed that. Um, but so I had too. one of those experiences that you talked yeah. about in terms of being able to really tease out what's, what's going on. I had a really odd thought, actually, that I'd never had about your work before, so I'm going to hang myself out to dry here. I'd never seen the, the duets before, the early duets. Mm -hmm. um, and I was laughing. I was just up there having a great time. And then I went into the secret pastures, and I wondered how much, was there an element in the anti, the, the resistance, to secret pastors, that not only was it flirting with narrative, which was at that time taboo, not only was it flirting with um, uh, design and, and uh, style and fashion, but it was also campy. The duets? Uh, the whole thing. Well, yeah, well, that's what kind of jumped oh. into my head was no, how do you, there how do you, what is, did you, what do you mean? How? There was an element that I've never read as describing the duets, mm -hmm. that there was uh, that sense of kind of distant humor. It mm. wasn't, it wasn't serious, you know, when you read about it, and I wasn't there, how serious and how theoretical was, and yeah. you guys were having a yeah. good time, and Arnie was doing his thing, mm -hmm. and the, the dynamic which then goes over on a big scale, uh, tongue in cheek. Mm. Uh, yes, there was. To that's, have, true. that's true. I'd never thought of mm. it as being uh, camp, mm. and that no one ever really has has uh, seen mm. it that way. And I just went, "Oh my gosh, that, right. that's." Well, camp is about a kind of, of irony, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And you know, I used to say this. And I don't know if the black folks in the room. I used to say that I don't think black folks are long on irony. Uh, at least I didn't think I was. I didn't really know what 
camp was. I didn't, because uh, a lot of those things, I just such, I came from low working class mm -hmm. people, television culture. Uh, I thought I was changing the channel. We'd go from doing you know, what we had learned in modern dance mm -hmm. to suddenly let's do uh, the twist. You know, now that would be considered camp, but I thought it was another vocabulary. Yeah. You're just slipping it in. Yeah. Or we were, uh, we were um, God, I, you know, it's so hard to see it in those duets. Yeah. But uh, there well, was a piece of an early one called Arnie. Begin I the Begin. Arnie. Yeah. And his yeah. attitude, oh, yeah. his mm -hmm. attitude towards what's going on. <laughs> I think it's what kind of jumped out. You know, I love him so much. It's, I really love him and he's a hero to me still you know you know there's one thing about that fucking article when she said he was arlene croce in new york don't let, you don't have to say the the name. Name. you don't even have to say the name right but i play john the baptist to his jesus christ right you know it was so man the woman may she live long and prosper but that is that <laughs> What, you doubt my sincerity on that one? Speaking well, of camp. You know, you know, it's, I'm just being <laughs> camp here, right, right. No, no, but I'm saying there was something that he was doing that was as much as me talking about being a black man and like in a white world, dancing in avant-garde, but that was who he was. You know, he, um, when I first met him, he, he loved, this was a real no-no. We were like, I'm saying, dropping acid at Woodstock, Jimi Hendrix, all that stuff. And Arnie liked Barbara Streisand. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, that's that's. And he never apologized saying. about it. Uh, yes. You know, uh, I couldn't bully him with that. You know, he really liked that. You know, and uh, so, and he was in a he was, he was. I, I found him one of the most manly men I've ever known, and I have known men. Yeah, uh, he, many a man I have. Many men, but but he was an effeminate man. He was an androgyny, and he had um, there was a culture. I mean, when we were kids, I'm kids. I remember the first time I went home wearing, you know, trying to dress like him and do like him. And he had, we'd gone to the Goodwill and he had bought these incredible like 40s jackets like this, you know, Joan Crawford. He would cross dress, you know, that whole glitter period and all, you know, wearing a pair of jeans and then he'd have like a, a lambskin little number like Judy Garland would have worn or something like that. And would wear it like, you know, this is, this is who he was, you know. And I remember I, I was saying, oh God, I don't know if I can wear these. A liberated man can wear anything he wants to wear. He would say to me, you know, he would talk like that. Truly, he did. He saw it as a real political statement, and he thought, I have a right to do it. So when he revealed himself on stage in what you, yeah, it was what you call camp, I imagine that's what, that was his, his yeah. himself coming out. We'd call it now a gay identity. But he was just, that was my, my black identity is in my hips. Where was his gay identity? Uh, his gay identity was in who he was dancing with, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You know that Leslie Fielder? You know, you know the art critics in the room, or Les the literary critics? You know him, a critic from the 50s? He wrote a bunch of incendiary essays, uh, one of which was called Come Back to the Raff Huck. You know that <laughs> one? And it was all about the American, great American novel, Mr. Melville, uh, James Fenimore Cooper, some ways, uh, probably Hemingway, I'm not sure, but he would use examples that the American male, black, white American male, had a fantasy that would be Tom, I mean, Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn. You're on a raft, this child boy, pre precocious, with a huge black savage male next to you, who is a child, and you can control. So there's Queequeg, right, and Moby Dick, there is Huckleberry Finn, there is, what's the Indian's name in uh, Last of the Mohegans, you know. So he wrote this essay, and uh, that was in, called Come Back to the Wrath Hook, implying that it is a homosexual thing and is a kind of it's underlying the male, white American heterosexual mystique. And then he also talked about, he wrote one about Walt Whitman called, I think he used the term fags. You probably could do that at that time, but I, maybe it was gays. Uh, fags and blacks about how they were known to hang out in black neighborhoods, homosexuals. You know, uh, you know what I'm getting at. So in a certain way, one expression of his homosexuality was his outrageousness and being 
with me oftentimes in a position I'm bigger than he is. Mm. I lift him, I carry him. He allowed me to sit on, to lay on top of him. Uh, all these sort of things, although he wanted, he, he was, also, he did, because, reverse, because of contact, yeah, improvisation, right. this, uh, there was something very ecumenical and about it. We were working, and all these things, I can't say we weren't aware of them, mm -hmm. but uh, it didn't matter at that time. You mm -hmm. could do whatever you want to do. Be who you want to be. Let it come out, you know? He, he, I remember when at the, at the university, um, there was the gay lib groups that had its own problems around certain racial issues, but he told me that uh, he was talking about something with a bunch of the, of the, of the guys, the, and uh, they said, he said, oh, I'm into, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm into, uh, I, I like color. They said, yeah, obviously, and size, you know, <laughs> because of who his lover was, you know, and uh, that was something that he actually was not afraid, uh, afraid to show, mm -hmm. you know, that he loved this man. You know, and your imagination would run, run wild. But how do we get there? <laughs> yeah. See, I took so us there, we're didn't going, I? So See, we're, this is we're the going problem. through right. the exhibit, and then after uh, we mm -hmm. Secret Pastures, we have the frame from After Secret Freedom Pastures, there came uh, Animal actually Trilogy. Animal Trilogy, which was inspired by the music of Conlon and Carroll and the amazing fantasy world of Cletus Johnson. Um, and you got in trouble with that one too, because you took on. Phallogene. Oh, you mean because of the reference to Serenade? Yes. Yeah, I had, we'd already done this piece actually for the Ailey Company. It wasn't successful for them, uh, but I, I had this image that this was Balanchine's uh, first piece in America, and he was re-envisioning oh. the American dancer. Oh, it actually, right. was wasn't it? 1929. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, was it 1931? 34. Oh. Uh, it might even been 31. You know, something like that. Like pretty early. So I thought, you know, you know, Serenade, you know, that movement wherein um, the, uh, the, there's a woman who goes into a beautiful arabesque, the man is down, there's another woman who stands over, and he just somehow revolves her by her point. Well, I did that with uh, a, a black man named uh, Danny Brown, Ailey, long, uh, skinny, the classic round head, long body, and I did it with him and other things like that. And I remember, um, and, and she and Anna, if you hear, I, I have not, I'm not, she and I had real problems because she thought I was really making war because I, I quoted it like as if um, declare, like I was angry about it, but I'm not no longer upset about it, truly, I'm not. She was, um, she thought that I was making fun of Balanchine. Is it an homage or is it a spoof uh, by displaying an ugly, gawky male arabesque instead of, Balanchine always said, ballet is woman. Right? Okay. Did you ever hear the one about? No, no, <laughs> no. no, no I, 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 I was told. No, I should. I would get sued for that one, right? About his, his so, but, so no. still taking on and right. thinking through, and what we were if gonna. We we thought that we were gonna take this sacred cow, mm -hmm. and which we were is going the name to of one of the one of the sections, sections. which came later. Mm -hmm. This was, first one was called How to Walk an Elephant, uh, and so. We were going to take this and recast it. First of all, they're going to be black people. It won't be a universe of beautiful European white mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. It'll be all black people, male and female. We'll mix the genders up, mm -hmm. and we will use mm -hmm. Conan and Carol's music, which is the, op which is mm -hmm. the opposite of Tchaikovsky. Right. But there would be references, mm -hmm. real plucked moments, <laughs> obvious, so you recognize right. them, but rephrased, right. restated. Isn't that a term? Yeah, mm -hmm. restated. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did we get into trouble about it? Yeah, I, you know, she, she did. <laughs> She, she was offended by it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like I made a, a personal front. And I said, wait a minute, this is my father's work. Mm -hmm. He's my dad too, yep. you know? And that's where this whole issue came. Who owns? Who owns it, Who owns you know? It? You see what I mean by these minefields, these little holes we can step in? Who owns right? it, yeah. And we were in Italy around that time and somebody said, a person writing, uh, this black American is coming, he, he thought both Arnie and I were black, are coming in there, they are doing what works that uh, are about European, something about Verdi and the, the grand tradition of uh, European Romanticism. What can a black American tell us about European Romanticism? Mm -hmm. Right, he said this in the, in the preview. We'll see, he said, you know. Mm -hmm. 
though. Who owns the discourse and who has the right to talk about what? We do, don't we? We. Well, it's this yes. we, Kimo Sabi. That, yeah. So, so, so having said the, that I believe there is a we, right. we own it. We made which, it. Which we own we. it. Yeah. Right. So let's go and then the next galleries, which mm -hmm. I uh, really appreciate how the curators made parallel galleries, really, out of uh, Uncle Tom's cabin mm -hmm. and still here, both right. long narrow galleries mm -hmm. and both as I was we were talking before uh, as I read your work different approaches to the question of we mm. and the uh, issue of difference and similarity mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. when you go through those galleries right how do you think back on the projects that you had with each of those works mm. and how they came to pass and how they helped to get you where you are today with... It's a lot of questions. There. I know. Yeah, that's a lot, right? How do I think about Uncle Tom's Cabin? Um, I, it was big and sprawling and excessive. Uh, it was as much about theater as it was about mm, movement. Yeah. It maybe was over ambitious. You know what? As I said in my book, I said it uh, did not succeed, but it could not, it did not fail. Mm -hmm. And it was um, really trying um, to draw a big, big picture. Mm -hmm. And it wanted a black voice drawing the picture. The specificity now, of who we is? Well, who's... Who, and then by the end of the piece... Well, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. The fact is, there's this whole thing that to be, to make good work, it can't have a real personal location. That was, that was the assumption, and maybe it was my own. About that what, that what, was your assumption. What modernism was saying. Mm. We don't want to know about Picasso's sex life. We just want to see picture, picture after picture, after picture of women in vaginas and women, 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 women. Which we don't ask about his sex life. What did he like to do in bed or whatever. We don't ask about his feelings about women. Now we do, we, yeah. but at that time we did <laughs> right, not. Right. So, I want to say, oh no, I'm going to make a piece. This is actually a black artist speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, as a black artist, and if you look, read carefully what he's talking about, you see all of his influences. You see his, the Cunningham, you see uh, Meredith Monk, you see Proust, you see uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the black church. And my mother was on stage praying, mm -hmm. you know? And that was not like Meredith would have done it. I, I wanted to actually talk about forms. Estella Jones stands there. And incidentally, she's coming this week. Uh, she's coming tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Uh, she was praying, and that's a form. I'm a formalist, I was saying. This is an ex examination of forms. It is a way of praying. And it was something taught to her by a mother, ancient. Oh, one more time. And then, you know, like, she would pray, and I want you to thank this. And then her son, over, Bill, is over there doing isolations and trying not to interpret what she's saying, but the cadence is the way she's saying it. So that I'm trying to use my body to shine a light on the way, on her form, with my form, and vice versa. It takes meaning, this mm -hmm. shuddering, this dropping means one thing, when she's saying, please, Lord, please, kind Savior, come on into this house this afternoon. But you know, I could do that uh, to mm -hmm. Kurt Schwitters, or Sonata, or to uh, Beethoven, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's what I was doing. It was a work that was asking us to read a lot of different mm -hmm. forms and styles at the same time, mm -hmm. asking us. But yet it was not disinterested. No. As no. high modernism, as you pointed out, would say we are doing form from a very disinterested no yeah. place. Yeah. Now, in you defense of those persons who say that, the best which... ones are always deeply committed to something and they're passionate about something. They've chosen this stance because here they have, they get the maximum force, the maximum bang for their butt. Uh, bang for their butt. <laughs> <laughs> right, anyways, they, uh, <laughs> they, there's something to, to push against, you know what I'm saying? There's something to push against by that restraint. Mm -hmm. By that restraint, there's something to push against. For them. For them. And now, quite frankly, I, I I'm, more, I'm coming closer to that myself even now. I understand right. the power in it. Yeah. But with uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was not just a disinterested formalist work. 
Uh, no, it was not disinterested, but you have to admit, this person, that was, he was being literary, he was, being, he was deconstructing, there was, there was as minimalist references in it. He had to have been somehow or other set, distanced from it. Even him, his own persona mm -hmm. and his mother had to be somewhat detached to make the work that I made. Yes. Uh, to cast Leroy Jones as the Dutchman, and ask Sage Coles to uh, actually distance herself from the character she was asked to play. Mm -hmm. Justice, young black man, went to prison at 19, just out of jail, to ask him to do this very painful scene, which he gets killed in. And I'm asking all of these people who primarily were white, well-meaning, liberal people to be on stage as we have this racial mm -hmm. fight. Uh, we all said, we have, we're cool about this. Mm -hmm. we, this is art. And we can, we can juxtapose anything in art. We can push the envelope. Mm -hmm. uh, are we all on the same page? That's what it was saying. But then people, huh, huh, what is he trying to say? He's trying to make me feel guilty. It's, it's, these black people are so angry. Well, what's, what's going on here? Well, you know what I mean? I'm saying, wait a minute. I go back to me watching Joyce Whelan's sailboat. Mm -hmm. Are you watching what happens as you watch this thing? I'm, I'm actually proud of that work, you know? It, it, so you, can, yeah, you can criticize it a lot, but it's, it was important. It was important, yeah. No argument. No. <laughs> now, still here. What does it mean to walk through that one? Uh, I'm really impressed with Gretchen Bender's work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she got out to the show. Mm -hmm. um, she gave a great deal to it. I'm looking at all those people's faces on the wall and how they trusted me. Mm -hmm and how they truly believed that art could be something that they would lay their greatest terror uh, on this bonfire, you know, which is the way I think about mm -hmm. what you're doing as an artist. You're, everything is burning. There's a fire that we make a ritual fire, and it's everything that we have inside of us, our talent, our fears, our life, uh, all these thoughts. You put them there and you burn them, right? Because mm -hmm. everything is burning here. That's what, nothing stands still here. Uh, so uh, that is why I feel I'm proud of that. Uh, it does, there are things which are hard for me to look at. I watched a woman today as I went upstairs, she was listening and watching Larry's uh, monologue with sound off, talking about his mother Gloria. Mm. I knew Gloria, you know, she was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I knew what, it, what he was giving when he did that uh, about his mother. And you know, I told her she looked like a sperm. <laughs> you, know, you know, his mother's doing chemotherapy and she has no hair. He said, I told her she looked like a sperm. What an amazing thing to say to your mother, you know. <laughs> but but it, it was funny. It was truly funny. And it said a lot about how we felt about even what we were doing, about the material. Um, I'm, I'm proud of that for other reasons. When I came here, uh, there's a young writer here, a young woman who I met when I came here before, and she had never met me before. And Philip, we were at a round table. And, we were asking questions and she said, well, she was very um, kind of like you know, in my face about it. Later on, I think we came to some sort of, uh, of understanding where she said, well, you know, the, work, the only reason your work is talked about is because of this controversy, you know? Uh, and I thought, oh my God, is that how it all mm -hmm. comes down? Does that? The way I think about mm -hmm. what you're doing as an artist, you're, everything is burning. There's a fire that we make a ritual fire and it's, everything that we have inside of us, our talent, our fears, our life, uh, all these thoughts, you put them there and you burn them, right? Because mm. everything is burning here anyway, so that's what, nothing stands still here. Uh, so uh, that is why I feel I'm proud of that. Uh, it does, there are things which are hard for me to look at. I watched a woman today as I went upstairs, she was listening and watching Larry's uh, monologue with sound off, talking about his mother Gloria. Mm. I knew Gloria. You know, she was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I knew what, it, what he was giving when he did that uh, about his mother. And you know, I told her she looked like a sperm. <laughs> you, know, you know, his mother's doing chemotherapy and she has no hair. He said, I told her she looked like a sperm. What an amazing thing to say to your mother, you know? <laughs> but but it, it was funny. It was truly funny and it said a lot about how we felt about even what we were doing about the material. Um, I'm, I'm proud of that for other reasons. When I came here, uh, there's a young writer here, a young woman who I met when I came here before, and she had never met me before, and Philip, we were at a round table, and we were asking questions, and she said, well, she was very, um, kind of like, 
oh, in my face about it. Later on, I think we came to some sort of, of understanding where she said, well, you know, the, work, the only reason your work is talked about is because of this controversy, you know? Uh, and I thought, oh my God, is that how it all comes mm -hmm. down? Does that What those 200 you? people gave, what Gretchen yeah. gave, what the people who put their money into it, all the people who brought their, their grief to it, you know? Is it all about some controversy of something written? No, I don't think it is. I truly don't think it is, but the controversy is part of it. It's part of it. It will be there. It's there. It's, and you know what helps Does it me? You know what helps stay me with you? You know what helps me deal with that? What? Is the we. This happened to us. You know, this happened to us. Someone made something. Now, I'm not dissociating here as a madman, but I have to do this. Someone made something that caused us to yeah. look closely at our looking. Yeah. And it made us very angry, it was hurtful, a lot of stuff about us came out. And you know, and then I can step back in and say, you know, uh, that hurt like hell, but you know, I'm so glad that I was part of that discourse. Uh, what more do we want to work to do? It meant something to people. They had to talk about it, they had to have an opinion yeah. about it. Hey. That's we. Mm -hmm. You showed up for life. Mm -hmm. One last question before we open it up to mm -hmm. the audience. As an artist through this journey, which we see artifacts of up in the galleries here mm -hmm. at the Walker, what have you learned, and the assumption is you will continue to learn Mm. The bill we know, we can make that assumption. What have you learned about what it means to make a voice mm. as an artist? If there is, what is that thing? Speak. Um, I, one Speak, sing. Now listen. Speak and sing some more. Listen some more. Now, could I do speak and sing from a place deeper or other? Now, listen. Now, as you listen, you realize that there's singing going on everywhere and speaking going on everywhere. I mean this literally. That's what we do here. Schopenhauer sang, music is the true, how's it go, Bjorn, the evidence of being? Yes, music is the sound is the sound of being. The noise of being. The noise of being. And therefore I take it to mean art making mm -hmm. is the true is the evidence of being. And I dare say human being. No, that's what I've learned. I'm really privileged. I am doing a show with Jesse Norman called How Do We Do? great icon person who I love very much. She and I are now going to work and make something together. I don't know what it is. We're working on it. I'm making a piece with a musician, Fred Hirsch, brilliant jazz musician, called Out Someplace. It's going to try to meet what I do with his form. I'm making a piece called The Echo. It's, going to t it's trying to mm. hear the early romantics through, I would say, late 20th century or 21st century sensibility, but more honestly through my uh, sensibility and that of modern dance uh, would, would also we're using the music of Morton Feldman mm. in it. Mm. Uh, Morton Feldman said that he, uh, I, I believe I'm quoting him correctly, he decided to become a composer because Schubert died so young. Uh, the music is nothing alike, but there's something he heard in mm. Schubert from this, and this modernist heard in Schubert. Um, so I am listening and I listen through the forms mm. and I sing. Mm. I try to sing. More questions. Do you want to talk? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can the light? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So wave your hands, uh, get up and shake around. Down so here? Can... Yes, sir. I wish a performance would happen and 
and something is spoken to inside of us. And can we hold on to that because the thought seems to dissipate that? Or mm. do you feel as a performer you need that as a gift for your, mm. you know, what you've given us or so? Does that I love that. You? Yeah, I do think I do. I, I need that kind of, um, that's, I think that's maybe one thing I want. I want you, I want an immediate acknowledgement of the effort that we put into it. Mm. Uh, do you have to think that it was great, but it's just an acknowledgement that we did this mm. ritual together. They performed, and now we show some sort of physical uh, expression of it. Mm. Yeah, I think it's good. It's very good for performers. Clap more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, was there someone else? Yeah. That lady, there's a lady up. Um, Pardon? If you want to control the discourse, then why, why didn't you give a lecture rather than have an interview with an interviewer? Hmm. Is that a trick question or what? <laughs> right. No, no, we were having, not an interview, we were trying to talk and uh, allow you to hear us talk. I do do a lot of public speaking, you know. I do, on topics like uh, faith, Belief, beauty, community. I do a lot. I do it, and I do it pretty well. <coughs> yeah, but this is different. And she and I have a history, and there's something, things that come out in a conversation or directions that maybe wouldn't happen in a lecture. Bill, do do you think it's possible to control the disc? That one person no. can control the discourse. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No, there's a there's this rush. The discourse is like a river, a rushing mm -hmm. river, like mm -hmm. all of existence. You also pointed to that crazy dynamic between speaking and censoring mm. during the course of the discussion, that somehow it is a system which self, somehow self-regulates, unfortunately. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. What, what about it? Well, I think that speaks to the, f the fact that no one can control discourse. Even you though can one choose may try, not, to, you can choose not it, to talk. Which is another way of trying to control Well, or discourse. it's just, you know what you can control? Once I get angry, you got me. Once I break down and cry and show anything, if you've been in love, you know what I'm talking about. That's the tyranny. When I withhold my expression to you, that is a kind of control. Right. It, it has its price. Right. Right. It has a price, a price I've never been willing to pay. But it, is, it has its price. So it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, let's, mm -hmm. let's move on. Obviously, it's not who I am, you know. But who do I no, want to become? I think it's I a very become? interesting question. Yeah, who do I want to become is the question. <coughs> yes, man. Oh, there was a certain man right here who had his hand up. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was first exposed to your work uh, in a video class. Uh, mm. you, Madison, Can you all hear? No. The gentleman is saying he was first exposed to the work in a video class in Madison, Wisconsin, my work. Yes, uh, the piece, he was struck by the work Untitled, uh, which was made by John Sanborn and Mary Perillo in 1989. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I saw your, I saw the, uh, we started earlier, Disability was born mm -hmm. in Madison also. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what your opinion is on the role of video in dance as far as, you know, as an art form and as an archiving of dance. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's, the gentleman's wondering about my opinion of the, the role of video in, in, in the actual artwork and as an archival tool. Well, actually, I've said before that a lot of the way I'm working right now, I think it's achieved a greater richness because I can capture more that would have been lost uh, in working in another way. Now, as an art form, I think I, um, I, I like very much the way that um, video and dance were integrated in We Set Out Early. It's something that is very expensive technically, and it's also, it, to share the stage with another form like that also takes its toll on dance. And there, I think there's an awful lot, um, it's wonderful, but there's an awful lot I want to see if I can get out of just dancing. So I'm not so inclined to use video right now. Um, now, of course, all of my works, we're working on getting, uh, we set out early, videotaped for television and done mm. Um, you know, what's the word? Reformatted, uh, transposed for that medium. In other words, we need a good director who sees the work and will recast it in a new poetic language. 
I would like to see all of my works exist in that way. And then I feel all right with letting them go. Other than that, I feel uh, a bit like they've been squandered somehow, because the audiences are not huge for the work. And time, memory is short. Um, some things they should be forgotten, but <laughs> some things it's good. There's a document you can say to someone, still here, his, this, here's an example of it. There's a documentary about it, and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. the, the, the woman is saying she's seen a lot of my sister Odessa Jones's work. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you've ever collaborated with her. On this very stage, we did a work which was called uh, uh, Perfect Courage, which was she, Idris Akamore, and myself. And it was storytelling, and it was some movement, and it was a lot of fun. And we won a, for those of you who come from San Francisco, we won an Izzy Award for it, as a matter of fact. Yes, was there someone else uh, in the top there who I'm not seeing? Say, speak if your hand is up. Is there, someone's pointing to someone else. <laughs> Over, just start talking. Over there, in the corner. Yes, but he's not in the back. <laughs> right, okay, that's clear. Nobody in the back is speaking? If you would, sir. I, I, have, I have a real concern about access to the art form of modern dance. I'm wondering if you could talk to us about if you are satisfied with the access that poor people and people of color have to mm -hmm. the art, mm -hmm. and if not, mm -hmm. on the top of that, maybe the art world in general. Mm -hmm. the, the world of Am I satisfied with it? Are you satisfied with, with the accessibility, with the access that people of color and, and poor people have to the art? No, I'm not. I, I, yeah, how do I answer that question without being glib? Because I know it's a, it's a serious question, but you realize it's a question that is an oppressive question right now. Of course we're not satisfied with it. Of course we're not. I'm not satisfied with the access that poor people have to education and health care. You know, I'm, I'm outraged by it, as a matter of fact. Um, so, I thank the Lila Wallace folks for actually giving me this red-hot challenge, which is to um, delve into uh, finding ways to broaden my audience base, uh, giving me the money uh, to be here in Minneapolis, for instance, and doing workshops and uh, meeting people in different communities, like communities, people of color, young people, an elusive group. And we're not talking mm -hmm. just like people who are poor. We're talking people who just think that anything that happens on the, the live stage that they don't know about from television or popular medium is not interesting. How to get them in there, to turn them on. Uh, that we're, we're doing a lot of those sort of events this week. This is the first week of this, uh, this four-year project, and Minneapolis is the first place. So I'm, I'm going out a lot. Um, I'm trying to talk. I'm trying to, we're doing lecture demonstrations. We're um, different sorts of encounters to encourage people to come. Now, they've got to, first of all, be interested. Now, it's the presenters in the, in the town, how the funding works, how do you price the tickets? I don't know how to do this. I know everybody is broke right now, and art costs money. Um, who's going to pay for, if you want to, I mean, I would love to make sure at Northrop 200 tickets are given away to people who um, don't have the money. Am I going to pay for them? Can my organization pay for them? We can't. No, we're struggling. Uh, I don't know how to do it, but I do think the access, first of all, can they meet me? Can they see what we do and trust us? Do they find it interesting? Uh, you know, there's, there's, that's a gap too. These same people who probably pay the 750 or what is it, an average ticket to go see uh, Saving Private Ryan, Armageddon, or Godzilla, uh, are they going to pay to see um, a modern dance concert? And some of which I know are probably not much more than that in this very town. Mm -hmm. uh, now, our show, I don't know, probably tickets are a bit more. But people have their taste and what they think is worth paying for. You know? Um, but no, I am a bit outraged by it. And I want to do my part to change it. Yes. I'm interested in the relationship between the artist and the performer, artist as performer, and the audience as spectator. Because um, I'm interested in the relationship between the performer and the audience. Because the performer can see something that is unique to the performer. Now, say it once again, ma'am. Perhaps 
more like the artist as the performer um, and the we as the witness, or perhaps the artist performing ritual, which might involve the participation of the audience. Mm. Um, well, think, all of the above. Okay. You are participating by being a witness. Um, like I'm saying, something's happening. Quote, energy is being shared. And that's what we are, right? We're sharing it, sucking it in, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also to the Greek model, that this is a place um, where we come to see and be seen. And we would like to have acted out here on stage um, these deep, deep, human situations that are more than we can cope with in our lives, although we are coping with them, life, death, betrayal, desire, but we want to see it there, spun into a metaphor, spun in such a way that we can handle it, process it, take it in. Um, that is a very, and the Greeks, they came to those things, if you were a Greek citizen, it was a religious observance to come to those plays. And it was also art. Yeah, at its best, I'd like to have that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? How did I transform to work in France? No, well, working in France. Right. Uh, mm. Well, I love the French thoughtfulness, mm -hmm. and they have a kind of a, they got a funk to them. I don't know how to say it. They, uh, you know what I mean? They know about taste. They know what orgasm is. They know where to, uh, when something is outrageous, they draw back, but then they have this mechanism that this outrage is suddenly organized interpreted, uh, deconstructed, put into a philosophical framework, and, uh, okay, the, oh yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, that's, the, that's what that is, you know. Pardon? How did I make them angry? Ah, Jacques Brel, dancing to Jacques Brel. <laughs> it's true, that was the angriest I've ever seen in all audience, dancing to Jacques Brel. Pardon? Oh, I can hum it, but I, uh, I can't. I don't, the French, I, I love it very much. I'm, the dancing to his recordings. And you know, those recordings are like, I don't know if there's anything that you, we, we're all such a different ages here now, but there was a time if I sang, uh, Hey, Jew, don't be afraid. You know, we knew what that meant when they said, don't be afraid. Oh, that night on Ed Sullivan. This is out on Ed Sullivan, he's singing about, uh, into the war, he's singing about how we're all feeling and all. My uh, w generation uh, owned that music. Now I think the French, in a way, even own, certain generation owns Jacques Brel even deeper. And for me to come in and start doing this dance, which was not really acting out the words. Um, wait a minute, what are you, this is, this is part of our patrimony here. What are you doing with this? You, you're handling it too roughly or you don't really understand what you're doing. Some people really were angry about that. Other people found it curious or other people thought it was, ah, passe, you know, we like what you're doing better when you talk about American things. It, uh, that's French culture, it's French pop culture. But that was where they got closest to being really angry. Yeah, but you don't get the kind of responses, I didn't get the responses to nudity in France that I got in places like Italy or in other places. Um, Black Hood. Well, that, that's, that's a difficult issue with the French. They're almost mm -hmm. too accommodating of my negritude. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? In other words, uh, the black man yeah. and his problems <laughs> in America. <laughs> you don't have those problems here, do you? Here we are open, we, fr we welcome you here. Uh, the black man, the black woman, you know, like all of this, you know. And um, it was when I did Uncle Tom's Cabin, as you know what Uncle Tom's Cabin was about, the issues of race and so on. I said, okay, where are your niggers? Where are your niggers? 
Well, what, wait a minute, what are we, we, don't, we don't have that here. No, 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 you do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But like anybody, but they were good about it. I mean, they were there to talk about the issues, the French, and I thought that they were brave about it. Um, that I, I really, intellectually, I really trust them, and the way that they saw it as art. That was what I like. All this crap about uh, social work. It's not art, it's just guilt-tripping people. It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's not art, you know. No, they saw it as a type of art that, I was, that we were making. And that I appreciate very much. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, mm. I'm sorry. I enjoyed coming here today and hearing you talk about what it's like to be middle-aged. The lady says she's enjoyed coming here today and hearing what, uh, me talk about what it's like to be middle-aged. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead, please. And, uh, and it occurred to me that perhaps this is part of the dream that we, we all mm. should we live long enough mm. have to deal with being 46 and having several younger selves mm. to look back on mm. and it's a privilege in a way, isn't it? I mean, I can imagine a lot of 46-year-olds would love to be able to have a show devoted to the thing that they love best in their life so they can get a chance, like everyone else, to walk through it and look at it, think about it. Yeah, that's true. But you know, some of my, some of my deepest friends right now are people in their 80s. Now, there's something about HIV that does make a kind of, I know my mother and I turned a corner when Arnie died and my father had just died. So there was a lot of stuff happening. And she sort of realized that my, oh, you mean you got that thing too? You know, she never said it, but that was going on. And she realized that her concerns about diminishing abilities, uh, uncertainty of the future, mm -hmm. she suddenly saw me in a different way. And I think there's a closeness, literally. Now, sure, I was able to take her around the world and she'd get on stage and be the Queen of England and all that. But <laughs> the fact is, I think that part of her love for me, she suddenly thought that I maybe knew something that maybe a lot of them, others maybe didn't know. Never, we've never had this conversation. I could be totally wrong, but I think that happened. And uh, Bjorn's mother is 70, what? 78, a woman who, uh, a Jewish woman, uh, lived in Europe during the war. She survived the war. She didn't go to the camps, but she actually came very close and she lost many people. Her, she's not a believer, not religious person, who's dealing now with Parkinson's and the way these spiritual questions that we're talking about, you know, the woman is a virtuoso, you know? She can really talk about her condition and how things are not, she's not expecting to, quote, get better, you know? Uh, but she's enjoying, you know. So that is a privilege. Merce, to be able to see that man still kicking at his age and uh, the work getting more and more generous and uh, bigger, richer, more outrageous, you know. Uh, that's, that's something we should be talking about, that kind of courage. I yeah? Think we have time for one or two, Anastasia, are we? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> last, last night on Earth? Last night on Earth, Last night on Earth, sorry. Day, and night. I enjoyed it very much. I didn't know you had written another book, and I was wondering if you mentioned something about that, and mm -hmm. why are you writing this book? <laughs> um, well, Last Night on Earth was an invitation uh, that, from an editor who had read an article that, I uh, that, I, that had been written about me. And it was, I said, why not? And also at that time, I maybe was really concerned about getting it down as I saw it, you know, since so much was being written. And I didn't know it was going to happen. That's what Last Night on Earth was about. Uh, this new book is a children's book. Susan Cooklin, a fantastic photographer, who I've known since 83 when I was doing the original How to Walk, excuse me, How to Walk an Elephant, said she wanted to do a book with me. And would I write it? Now, it's just um, about 12 lines or so. Tell, tell me. What language would you use to talk to a child about what you do? Formally? Poetically? Uh, maybe philosophically, but uh, if you can get the formal and the poetic together, they can do a lot of the other. Now, make it lively. And um, 
do it in photos, pictures, with your body. No, no gimmicks, don't condescend to them. I wanna dance. When I dance, I am everywhere and I'm barely there. When I dance, I am everyone and I'm only one. When I dance, I make curves, I make lines. And it was good exercise for me. Cut down to the quick, elegantly, elegantly presented, and to a very open and imaginative audience. That was another thing I said the audience should bring. Bring a little imagination. And I have a niece who is seven years old, Chaz. And I thought about her. What would get her imagination? So that's why I did that one. This might be a good moment to retire to the book signing, actually. There will be book signing of, of uh, Bill's new book out in the lobby, I believe. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs>